unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Tonight, I want to share something very interesting. And, uh, and I believe that it's going to be a very liberating factor for some of you. Uh, and it's going to be a very encouraging experience for many of you. Praise God. John chapter 5 verses 39. John chapter 5 and verses 39. Give me the Amplified Bible. I want you to hear the spirit of the Christ. Jesus says, you search and investigate and pour over the scriptures diligently. Because you suppose and trust that you have eternal life through them. You understand what I'm saying? So he's speaking to religious people. Fellows who took salvation not for an experience of relationship, but for a place of religion. You understand what I'm saying? But even the most religious person in this world believes this one thing, that through those scriptures there is life. They believe it. They don't argue about that. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he says, you search and investigate and pour over the scriptures diligently because you suppose and trust that you have eternal life through them, and these very scriptures testify of me. And still, the Bible says, you're not willing, but you refuse to come to me. And the Bible says, so that you might have life. They receive the word of God, but they refuse to come to him, that they might have life. They refuse to come to him. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, the Bible says, I receive not glory from men. And he says, I crave no human honor. I look for no mortal fame. The Christ is trying to tell them, look, I'm not like some of you who are looking for mortal fame and human honor. I did not come because I seek human honor. I seek my fathers. And the next verse says, but I know you and I recognize and I understand that you have not the love of God in you. And the next verse says, he says, I have come in my father's name and with his power. And you do not receive me. Your hearts are not open to me. You give me no welcome. But if another comes in his own name and his own power and with no other authority but himself, you will receive him and give him your approval. And the next verse says, how is it possible for you to believe? How can you learn to believe? You who are content to seek and receive praise and honor and glory from one another. And yet you do not to seek the praise and honor and glory which cometh from him alone who is God. And the next verse says, put out your minds, the thought, and do not suppose, as some of you are supposing, that I will accuse you before the Father. This is Jesus telling people. Do not even think that on the day of judgment, I'm going to point a finger and say, ah, that is the woman that I was telling you who did this. No, no, no. He says, there is one who accuses you, present continuous. It is Moses. There is one who accuses you. It is Moses. The very one on whom you have built your hopes and in whom you trust. Some people have built their hopes and trust in the man who will accuse them that day. And they refuse to put their hope and trust in the one who will not accuse them that day. Who loves them. Who does not seek his own. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the next verse says, For if, listen, you believed and relied on Moses, you would believe and rely on me. For he wrote about me personally. If you believed and relied on Moses, you would believe in me. And the next verse says, But if you do not believe and trust in his writings, how then will you believe and trust my teachings? How shall you cleave to and rely on my words? Somebody say, Amen. Amen. What a wonderful scripture. The Bible says, Jesus availed himself to people. Like the Bible says. But 
They searched out in the scriptures. They were hungry. They knew and affirmed and confirmed in their spirits times without number that eternal life came through the scriptures. They know that if they trust in the word of God and diligently search out to know what it says and receive it in their spirits, they will receive eternal life. But even though they went into the scriptures, they diverted off God. It's amazing that a man can go deep into the word and divert off Christ. It's amazing that a man can invest his time, his money, his resources, and everything there is in the middle to read the word of God, to read books, to open scripture every morning. You read five chapters, six chapters. You even studied so much, and then you graduated in different you know, schools of ministry. You've gone through every discipleship class. You've gone through Bible school. You've gone through every experience of life. And every time you're searching the scriptures, you know that these scriptures give eternal life through them. But the very scriptures that testify of Jesus, a man opens them, and he does not go to Jesus. He goes to the the accuser, Moses. A man opens the Bible every morning, and he refuses to come to the giver of life. Yet those scriptures testify of him. Think about it. Just think about it for a moment. Just imagine it for a second. That a man can open scripture and read and study, but he does not go to Christ. He goes to Moses. He goes to another. And here's the most interesting thing about it. I used to think that the people who fight grace do not believe in grace, misinterpret grace. I used to think that those people understand the law. That's why they don't like grace. But here now the scripture opens our eyes to know that because they did not understand Moses, they can't understand Christ. That means if a man is against the message of grace, that man doesn't understand even Moses. Because Jesus says, Moses testified of me personally. He was not talking about any other person. When Moses opened scripture, when all Moses was revealing Christ, he was talking about Jesus. He wasn't talking about himself. He was not seeking his own glorification. He wasn't seeking his own attention. No. It's amazing that Moses preached Jesus. And every time men go into Moses, they walk out of Jesus and follow Moses. And I love the way that Christ says it. I don't seek my own fame. That's the deliverance that every man of God should have. When you're free from the attention and fame of men. When you don't seek any more. That whether man fights or praises you, it doesn't change who you are. It's, it, it doesn't change whether they say you're good or they say you're bad. Whether they say you're wonderful or they say you're the worst thing they've ever met. It doesn't matter anymore. Why? Because you are not subject to the opinion of men. You are subject to the opinion of God. Paul says that if I was a pleaser of men, I would not have served God. Somebody shout hallelujah. For me, the moment I started preaching the gospel, I met every kind of person who wanted me to preach the way they want me to preach. You understand what I'm saying? I remember that time, some guy told me, you overwalk, stand in one place like Billy Graham. And then, two to four miles, I said, let me stand like Billy Graham and deliver the oracles of God without moving my muscle. And then make an altar call. It refused even when I would stand like this and I say, praise the Lord Jesus, I just see the leg going. Then in the mid, I remember, Olagawa boss, come on, come on, keep your pattern. And then I say, now this time, in my heart, now you're worrying with two things. Yeah, you're trying to deliver mystery. But in the back of your head, you're trying to recollect yourself and construct yourself according to the pattern of what the man of God told you to be. So you try again. Then the next thing, you know, somehow the message goes through you. You find yourself, kicking, wow! And then you say, oh, oh. Then you continue again. Then another person one time came and told me, you make many points in a sermon. Be making one point. Because you confuse people. One point, then you go to another one, then you go to another one, then you make many points. You understand what I'm saying? And in retrospect now, when I think back, all of these men who advised me, I don't know where they are. (laughs) I don't know where they are. Then another one told me how to follow a certain order from how you do your, bo- your, your introductions. My, draw your body, what? Go up, smile, what? Then you, eh? 
then uh, you start climaxing, crescendos, wow, then you close the service. <laughs> it refused also. I would climax on the beginning of the sermon. Eh, they've been so better. Praise God. Until the Lord told me, be you. I made you to be you. Don't ever try to preach like anybody. You minister the way you are. And so from that day was what? I was free. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah again. Now back to the point I was making. Jesus tells these guys, if you had believed on Moses, if you had understood the teaching of Moses, you would have understood me. But seeing that you don't understand Moses, you cannot know me. Because if you read Moses, he wrote about me personally. I asked the Lord one day, many, many years ago, and the Lord was commissioning me to the gospel. Not calling. I was called before I was found in my mother's womb, right? Before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Bible says you were called. Praise God. So you have a call of God upon your life. But the commissioning of God is different. And that's a very special occasion for every person. During that time, the Lord spoke to me something that I think I should share with everybody here. There's a difference between an apostle and a man of God. There's a difference between a prophet and a man of God. There's a difference between a teacher and a man of God. There's a difference between a pastor and a man of God. There's a difference between an evangelist and a man of God. The fivefold ministries, all of them we confirm that they sit in particular offices and these offices minister unto God according to the gifting that the Lord has alluded or allocated to every individual. There is a grace, it's called prevenient, that comes in your life to give you the ability to minister in the office with which the Lord has appointed you. Every office carries a certain glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. But not all are men of God. You understand what I'm saying? And the Lord started to show me the things that make a man of God. What are the things that make a man of God? In Deuteronomy, I think 33, verses 1, the Bible says, and this is the blessing where with Moses, the Bible says, the man of God blessed the children of Israel before his death. This, the Bible testifies of Moses as a man of God. And you read in scripture that there were prophets which were not called men of God. There were apostles which were not called men of God. Some of you think men of God is just a literal statement. You are a man who is of God. But that is a deeper responsibility and understanding of this. And in about a few seconds I'm going to explain that. When you, for example, let me give an average teacher of the word. A normal wonderful teacher of the word. Who can simply be a teacher of the word or can be a man of God? When you are a teacher of the word, like I am, like many of us are, you speak the oracles of God according to the office that the Lord has ordained and the grace given you. You get my point? That's what a teacher does. What makes you a man of God is the experience that you have with God that reveals your part in the gospel. There are people who are ministers of the gospel, but they don't have a part in the gospel. They do not have a very clear cut line of course that they must follow. A man of God is set on a certain course. You understand what I'm saying? That man does not just wake up to say, I'm going to preach what I want or what I feel. No. That is why when you interact with a real man of God, you will know the difference between a normal preacher, a normal pastor, a normal apostle. There's a difference. I'll give you an example. 
One of the true patterns and principles of a man of God, the Bible says we cannot do anything against the truth but for truth. No man of God can set himself against the spirit of truth. No man of God. No man of God. Balaam was a prophet, but he was not a man of God. Why? Because he used to wake up, prophesy. In fact, the Bible speaks of how he prophesied of the root of Jesse, the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But sometimes, that same fellow, yeah, sometimes there were times he would used to alast and go contrary to truth. You understand what I'm saying? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And one day we see at him seated on a donkey. And he's going the way the Lord wants him not to go. But he wants to go because he has a word that carries a weight that can change the story and course of Israel as we know it. You understand what I'm saying? A donkey has to smash him and that donkey spoke that day. But because the donkey spoke that day, it's not a donkey of God. Because God speaks through you or anybody else, it doesn't mean that you are a man or a woman of God because the Lord spoke through you. That donkey stayed no more. It wasn't buried in a special sepulcher. He doesn't have a generation of descendants which inherited a certain experience of promise. Where are we that they were given a certain place in the chronicles of men which spoke the oracles of God? That was the end of that donkey. Even in the Old Testament dispensation, we have seen the Lord speak through people. But because the Lord speaks through you, oh, it doesn't mean that you are a woman or a man of God. When Balaam understands that he could not curse whom the Lord has blessed, it was as though enough wisdom and knowledge for him to know that if you cannot curse whom the Lord has blessed, that's it, close it. But later on we realize in scripture that he continued in the craft of living in two worlds. Sometimes he would stand as a prophet, and in certain times the Bible says he would give into the gain sayings of Korah. He used to lust for the things eh, that came with the power. Of his office. And the next thing we know. When the Lord was not ready to speak. Balaam used to submit himself under another spirit. Because he had to hear. Again that's the problem. With people who think that you're on pressure to perform. That if you don't do a miracle people won't come. If you don't do this. If you don't demonstrate. Whether you. F- Listen. If you wake up and you don't feel it. Don't do it. A man of God whether you demonstrate power or you don't. Did you get what I'm just saying? Even if you don't prophesy, you still stay a man of God. When the Spirit of the Lord gives you utterance, you will speak. Even if you don't do a healing meeting, that's okay. You still stay a man of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Never put yourself on pressure to perform when you enter the ministry. Praise the Lord Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, a man of God can't do against the truth but for truth. There are many things. There is a faithfulness. That's one of the second patterns. The things that define a man of God. A man of God is faithful to the word. Faithful to the word. Besides just not going against truth. It's it's one thing not to go against truth. But you're unfaithful. Moreover, it is required in stewards. The Bible says that a man be found faithful. That man of God be found faithful. Faithfulness to the word of God. There are many, many things. But there's one thing that the Lord opened my eyes to many years ago. And this was it. He showed me that when he has a man or a woman of God, he reveals the bigger picture of purpose to that man. Not all the people in the Christendom understand divine purpose as it is ordained in its dispensation of time. When Jesus was born, there were men who were in the synagogue serving God. Normal men in the temple. But those men did not sense the birth of Jesus. But there was a man of God called Simeon. The Bible says when Jesus was born, Simeon sensed it. Nobody gave Simeon directions. He found his way to the Son of God. Because it was ordained for him. That he shall not die until he sees the salvation of Israel. That was his part. The Lord had revealed to him that on his line of existence of time, 
He had to see the salvation of Israel. That was a man of God. He lived under covenant to fulfill a certain purpose. His part was ordained in the history of the gospel. And as true as the Lord is, he comes and holds our Lord Jesus. And then he speaks many words of prophecy as the Lord had revealed him. And the Bible says, and while many of them watched and wondered, the Bible says these things Mary kept in her heart. Those are the very things that conjure the first miracle, even outside the timing of God. Because while many were marveling at the words that were spoken about the boy, Mary kept these things in her heart and pondered them. Everything that Christ was going to be was spoken by this man of God. It was his part. There was no way Simeon would die without speaking those words. There was no way Simeon would die without blessing the Son of God. There was no way. Even the Son of God was prophesied upon and prayed for. Do you understand why we commit children now to God? Do you understand why you take your child in the hands of a man of God and that man of God speaks words over your child? It's not what they speak that should come to pass. It's the things that the Lord will speak through them that must come to pass. It's not a should issue. It's a must come to pass issue. Every man of God, the course that I'm talking about, has an ordained pattern and purpose for which that man is on earth that goes beyond the general accountability of appointment. Like the church, all of us who are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, ye shall go into the world and preach the gospel of our Lord and say, Jesus Christ, baptize in, in, in my name. You shall cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, heal the sick, follow and with thee until the end. All of us are mandated to preach the gospel. We've been given the apostleship for the obedience of nations. All of us have the understanding and mandate to preach the gospel with whichever way the Lord has ordained us to preach the gospel. But there are people that the Lord has given special assignments in that time. That's a man of God. That's a man of God. We don't know how many they are. Many are called, the Bible says, but few are of the elect. And this election comes with its vindication. That is why when you understand what it means to be a man or a woman of God, or what it means to set yourself against a man or a woman of God. You see, it's like when he talks about how he deals with his own. The Bible is very clear eh? that the Lord vindicates his elect. For who shall lay charge on the Lord's elect. Who? It's not about the called of God. He's talking about the elect of God. Who shall lay charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifies? Now whether you are in the elect or not, I don't know. That's your choice. I don't know what relationship you carry with God. But when you understand the election which is of God, nobody lays charge on the Lord's elect. You don't lay charge on the Lord's elect. Why? Because they don't live on their course. Paul says, I know nothing of myself. So it's a small thing for a man to judge me because I know not. This was a man who was mandated to lay the foundation of the gospel. That man is not of his own anymore. You carry no place of judging a man who does not own himself anymore. You cannot. You can't. It doesn't mean that that man doesn't have an accountability before God. No. He does have an accountability before God. It doesn't mean that because people don't judge you, you don't have an accountability to God. No, 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 no. You have an accountability with God. But your accountability is to God, not to men. Never position yourself in a place, when you're sure that you're dealing with a man or a woman of God, never position yourself in a place where you want to judge a matter over a man or a woman of God. That's common sense in the kingdom. Because you don't know the pattern by which the Lord has set that man to flow. You don't know what even that man's issue that he's dealing with at that particular point is ordained for purpose. Because he's a man of purpose. He, listen, he phoned Peter. No, let me have an example. He phoned Peter. And he told him, I have seen that the devil has desired to sift you. But I have prayed for you. But he did not pray for Peter that the Lord would deliver him from the temptation. No, he says, but I prayed for you that regardless of the temptations you go through, that your faith fail you not. Now, who is the man to come and judge Peter for having fallen 
on the way. When the Lord himself, Jesus, knew that Peter would fall, and he still could not pray for Peter not to fall, because it's ordained for Peter to fall, the man's responsibility at that particular point is to make sure that Peter's faith does not fail. Why? Because like the grace was given to Paul to the uncircumcised, it was given to Peter and James to the circumcised. That was the grace ordained to Peter. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. From that day he owned Peter. You cannot lay a charge on the Lord's elect. You can't. You can't. You can't. Gomer, the wife of Hosea, was also a woman of God in a way. Because she was fulfilling prophecy. Why am I buying back my wife? Oh, Hosea. This is not even about you. It's not even about you. What you're going through with your wife is me and Israel. But the best way I could communicate this was to expose your marriage. And then you find Hosea and then you start judging him. <laughs> that man of God. He doesn't give his wife time. That is why his wife goes to other women. He says, for I have found a man after my own heart. And even when David kills Uriah and separates the two, and then he marries Bathsheba, God still separates David from his sin. You don't need to, but God did. And he still said, this is the sinful part of David that I will deal with, but this is the man of God I have a covenant with. He must bring back the presence of God in Israel. What am I saying? When you are a man or a woman of God, whether you do what or what, you'll end up his. <laughs> he says of his kingdom and of his increase and of his government, the establishment, the Bible says they are of him. They are of him to cause, to lead and direct. He says, for the zeal of the Lord shall perform this. There are people God loves so much that his zeal will get them out of anything they are going through. Why? Because they have a covenant with God that goes beyond even their personal weaknesses. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. For henceforth, even forever, he says, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. There are things that are not even in your zeal to do. There are things that are not even in your hunger and thirst to do. There are things that are not even in your ability, your grace to do. There are things that are entirely ordained of the zeal of God. You didn't get what I just said. God can't ordain you to let you die. If he began a good work in your life, he will see to accomplishment to the day of Christ. Yes, you have made mistakes. Wash yourself, clean yourself, repent, turn back. The Lord will still use you because he has not changed his mind on you. Why did he still call you? When he knew you were weak, he still called you. He still chose Peter. When there was a John who was always on his bosom, he does nothing wrong. He loves Jesus. Every time he's seated on Jesus' chest, he's there enjoying the warmth of the Christ. But then he goes past this warmth and he says, Ah, ah John, proximity is not access. There is a man I have a covenant with. At that particular point, when he got the revelation that you are the Christ of God, I entered a certain covenant with him and I told him on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I don't care whether he's hung upside down or up, square up. He's still a man of God. Because he was ordained for it. He just doesn't teach every Sunday. He just doesn't preach every Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. He's not just special because he preaches on a conference and he heals the sick and casts out devils. They are all that, but they are not men of God because they don't have an ordained responsibility that comes with a revealed purpose that reveals their part in the general lot of the gospel. Moses was a man of God. Moses was a man of God. Exodus. He spoke, the Bible says, to Moses, 33.11, yes. He says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, face to face. The Bible says, as a man speaketh unto his friend. That was the relationship Moses had with God. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't speak to him the way some of you are spoken to by God. No. The Bible says he spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. 
That is why when Moses breaks course and goes against the traditions of Israel, not to marry outside his own, and then he goes to Ethiopia and gets a Cushite woman. The scriptures tell us, Aaron and Miriam, which are man and woman of God, they have a problem. They say, yes. Don't we hear God too? Has the Lord not spoken? Not only beyond the prophetic words that we receive by utterance, but the grains that have gone so long and old past eternal judgment that it's suckered for a man to marry from a majesty's own. Who does Moses think he is? And God calls Aaron, and then he calls Miriam. He pulls them in front of them. He told them, are you not afraid? Temutia. We are not talking about whether the guy has a cushite woman or not. No, 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 no. That's not what we are talking about here. No, 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 no. First put that, that's my business with Moses. I can deal with him, and I will deal with him on my own terms. But Miriam and Aaron, let's first talk here. Why are you not afraid to speak on my... You don't fear. That means even God fears. Even God. He comes and says, Why are you not afraid to speak about my servant? Why are you not afraid? You don't even fear. And then he says the very same thing. He says, when I speak to prophets, O men of God, I speak to them in visions and in dreams. But he says, but that is not how so I speak to my servant Moses. I don't speak to him in visions like you. I don't speak to him in dreams like you. I speak to the guy face to face. He beholds my very similitude. Now again, back to the point. Are you not afraid to talk about Moses? No, I'm not scaring you. I'm just giving you wisdom. So you will live longer. There are men I know who have erred. But me, the Lord told me not to touch certain men. I don't. I don't. Even if I see him go a certain way, I say, come on. That is why leprosy is on people. That is why he gave us the instruction. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. He separated leprosy from sickness. Read the Bible. He says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He puts leprosy from sickness. And he says, no, sickness is one thing, but leprosy is another. <laughs> Teach people to respect ranks. Not to exercise themselves in matters higher than them. Some of you, the things that are traveling your house, they are words you spoke on a man of God. Tony Komuzimu, no. No, Shidogo, you don't have demons, no. But you spoke of a man of God who hears and sees God face to face. The only challenge is that he didn't tell you that I see the Lord face to face. You just woke up and because even you, you have your own place of, of eh, where you have your own grace, where you can speak. Also, you, you opened your mouth. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> now you see your life. See your life. <laughs> Nothing can deliver you from that. Except if you change your mind and understand there are people you don't talk about. Me, there are people I don't talk about. I don't. Who am I to judge another man's servant? The Bible says if he falls, he falls to God. If he rises and stands, he stands to God. And the Bible says, but law, he is able to, Babula Mukama, he is able to make him stand. That means when God has possessed a man, even when that man has issues a million and one, God still looks to make him stand one day. Now the trouble is when the man of God again stands. <laughs> what will happen to you who spoke? <laughs> Some of you you, you, you set yourself against courses that you're not going to recover from. You're not going to recover from. I was recently praying for a certain person. They spoke things about me, but recently I had the state they were in. I found myself weeping for them. I understood. For that moment, I said, God, help this person. Forgive them. You get my point, eh? 
the, some of the people you seated with there, they might be average women and men, but they have a course with God. You might see somebody who sits, they laugh with you, but they have something with God. The day you touch it, you're going to open rays from the Lord of hosts. You will know that he has armies too. I'm not scaring you. No, I'm just giving you wisdom. Now, Moses was a man of God. He could not have beheld the face of God and not understood the revelation of God. Moses was not just a normal minister of the gospel. The Bible tells us in John that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. The law was given. The Bible calls it was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you what makes him a man of God. Remember, even in the olden times, the scriptures were spoken clearly that I shall appoint a prophet like you. God spoke to Moses and the children of Israel in that day. And he told them that I shall appoint a prophet like in the likeness of the Christ. It's more than just the normal things that they share. You get my point? There are, of course, those similarities. Eh, They both interceded for God's people 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness. There are a few similarities that Moses shares with Jesus. Those are okay. But when the Bible speaks of how he's going to raise a prophet from among the brethren like unto Moses, he's trying to speak something deep, and I'm going to explain that in a second. The man of God, Moses. So the Bible says, the law was given by Moses, but grace, the Bible says, and truth came by Jesus. Now the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me something about that scripture. The law was given by Moses. He could have said, but grace and truth was given by Jesus. But there's a reason why God uses given and came. There's a reason why God uses the word given and came. Let me show you something about Moses. (laughs) Galatians chapter 3, verses 19. Give me the Amplified Bible. But we're going to come back to that more. What then was the purpose of the law? And I'm going to come back to that. The Bible says it was added later on after the promise to disclose and what? Expose to men their guilt because of the transgressions and to make men more conscious of the sinfulness of sins and was intended to be in effect until the seed of the descendant, the heir, should come. And concerning, the Bible says, to whom the promise had been made. And it, the Bible says, the law, was arranged and ordained and appointed through the instrumentality of angels and was given, the Bible says, by the hand in the person of a God between Moses, an intermediary person between God and man. Moses was a receiver from God to give men. He wasn't the receiver of the law. He was the mediator. You didn't get what I just said. Moses was a mediator of the law. He was not the receiver of the law. Moses gave the law, but he did not live his life under the law. He was just a mediator. He was an intermediary person between God and man. He was here, and God gives man the law. And Moses receives it and passes it on. Then he looks... So Moses knows this part very clearly. He knows this part very clearly. God had revealed to him exactly what to do. That is why the scriptures say, when they were putting the, 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 the law, the, the what? The tablets of stone in the Holy of Holies. He says, this shall be as a witness against you. Moses didn't say, this shall be as a witness against us. No, he didn't include himself in the witness. No, he says, take this book of the law, put it in the inside of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there a witness against you, because me, the intermediary, I have done my part. This law is a witness against you, not me. I'm not in it. I'm not in it. I wish some of you understand what I'm saying. 
it doesn't mean that Moses did not obey the law. It only means that Moses was not subject to the law. He was a man of grace. That is why in Deuteronomy it says the righteousness of faith speaks this wise. And then Paul quotes him. Paul quoted Moses. And he spoke of the righteousness of faith. That means Moses had the revelation of the righteousness of faith in Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says the righteousness of, which is of faith speaketh in this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. And who shall descend into the deep. And that is to bring Christ again from the deep. For the, the word of God is nigh thee. Moses had experienced Christ. He had seen him. You remember the Bible says how he refuses to be called the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. Esteeming Christ. That means even in the Old Testament, Moses had seen Christ. He could not see Christ and follow the law. He couldn't see Christ and follow the law. Oh, you didn't get it. He esteemed the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Why? Because he saw Jesus Christ. Even in the Old Testament dispensation, the Christ was revealed to Moses. Moses could not have had a revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he follows himself. He saw Christ. He was a man of God under a mandate to give. That's why the Bible says the law was given. Given means that it was passed on to. By Moses. But grace and truth, the Bible says, came by. The Greek word there for came is ginomai. It became. To become. In fact, if I can read for you the right rendering, he says the law was passed on by Moses, but grace and truth became Jesus Christ. (laughs) Mama, did you get what I just said? The law was passed on by Moses. But grace and truth became Jesus. Why didn't he say that the law came by Moses? Because Moses did not become the law. Moses was not a man under the law. He was a representative of the ministry the Lord had put on himself, but he was not subject to the ministry of the law. He was subject to the ministry of death. And then he goes to Moses and tells them, look, Moses, let's do a deal here. I want to bring Jesus. This is the Christ. Moses sees the Christ in the spirit. And then tells them, but they will not receive him and appreciate him until they understand what it means to be without him. Let's add the law. That's why the Bible uses the language in Galatians. The law was added. Did you get what I just said? In 3.19. He says the law was added. For transgression. It was added. To expose. Listen. He says what was the purpose of the law? Understand it. He says it was added. Later on. That means men before lived without it. It's possible to live without the law. How many of you believe it? What does Romans 7.9 say? Romans 7 9. Romans 7 and 9. Give me the amplified. He says, For I, once I was alive, but quite apart from, and the Bible says, unconscious of the law. He was unconscious of the law. But when the commandment came, sin lived again, and I died, and I was sentenced by the law to death. That means there was a time he was alive. Without it, not even conscious to it. Some people think when you remove the rope, uh, people are going to sin. No. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. People don't sin because the law is absent. There were men which were alive without the law. Abraham lived before Moses. Didn't he go to God? Didn't he ascend in glory? Isn't he among the fathers of the faith? Didn't he live without it? So how can you tell me That without the law, you can't live. That's why some people teach a funny gospel. They say, you have to balance. You can't. You can't balance death and life. That is inclining to death. Because the Bible says death existed from Adam until Moses. Until Moses. Until Moses. Until Moses. Until Moses. Death existed. Until. Until Moses. Until Moses. Until Moses. So, let's go back to Galatians. He says the law was added. Let me tell you why the law was added. God went to Moses. 
Moses wasn't just preaching the law like a lost man, like many people are lost. Hey! Some people are just lost. They preach the law aimlessly. They don't even know what they're opening. The Bible says, desiring to be teachers of the law, knowing not what they say, neither from whence they are firm. They don't have a place of affirmation. They don't affirm it. They don't speak from a place of, this is why I'm preaching the law. They don't have an affirmation. They don't have a source and base of it because they don't preach it in wisdom. It's not even wisdom. It's just excitement. Oh, some of you are even preaching what you find other people preaching and you don't even examine to know whether it's true or not. Let's go. Do you know how many people understand grace but they fear to preach it? A certain man of God, a big name in Kampala, big, 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 big name. He found me one day. He told me, Apostle Grace, I had you preach grace. I told him, yes. He told me, you're just doing what we fear to do. Keep on doing. <laughs> Up to today, the chap doesn't preach grace. But he knows it is true. No. They fear. They fear. <laughs> they fear those guys. <laughs> you remember when Peter was eating with the Gentiles? And then some Jewish proselytes came, or were they from Judea or something? And then Peter saw them, and he separated himself. <laughs> some of you, the reason why you fear preaching grace, you fear what people will think about you. Give me verse 13. I want to read you that thing in the message. It's very funny. Uh, verse 12, I think. Verse 12, Galatians. Uh-huh. Here is the situation. Earlier before, Certain persons that come from James Peter regularly and ate with the non-Jews, okay? Because they had embraced grace during that time, of course, non-Jews were isolated. That's why I don't understand a Gentile who is under the law. Because, because the law was to the Jews. Because of the law, Gentiles could not pray in the same synagogues with Jews. So the Bible says, here's a situation. Earlier before, certain persons had come from James Peter regularly and they ate with the non-Jews. But when the conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That is how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that has been pushing the old system of circumcision. And fortunately, the rest of the Jews in Antioch the church, joined in that hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was swept along in the chariot. And Bible says, but when I saw, Mark Henry, Paulo, sit next to me in heaven, he says, but when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady straight course according to the message, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all and I says, if you are Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem. What right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to the Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem colonies? The next verse says, We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. Oh, me, I'm a Jew. We have got special people. No, you have no advantage. You are just the first. That they make you of advantage. <laughs> you were just the first. They make you of advantage. And the next verse says, We know very well that we are not set right. Bandange, we are not set right with God by rule keeping. But only. Somebody say only. <laughs> through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? He said we tried it. We have the best systems of the rules of the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. And he says, have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? Have some of you noticed? No great surprise, right? And you're ready to make the accusation that since people like me, Apostle Grace, who go through Christ in order to get things right with God, aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore have been an accessory to sin. That accusation is frivolous. Because we are going through Jesus and we are not going through your Moses Ten Commandments, we are sinners. We are telling people to sin because we are not going through your Ten Commandments. That's their problem. 
Because I don't preach Moses, they think that we are using Jesus as an accessory to sin. It's so amazing that when you start preaching Jesus Christ, the grace, the first thing people will say is, ah, he's encouraging sin. No, no, no. It's not encouraging sin. They just want you to do things the way. And me one time, so I was asking myself, but why are people fighting some of us? And I understood very simply. God came in a package they didn't expect. <laughs> now, and this is just the beginning. There are people who are seated there. <laughs> they look like they're simple men and women. But it's only a matter of time. Forget the old systems when men look like their ministries. God is going to do something in you. Now you don't look like it. Now they say, Bishop, and a small man comes out. <laughs> because they think Bishop has to be a big guy. You remember this thing called the gospel that we preach? The words of this life? A guy, I think, the other Thursday, some guy brought me a photo of a big house. I looked at the guy. I said, why are you showing me this? He says, Musumba, it's my house. I looked at him, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not seeking to insult you. You don't look it. Asked him, how did you do it? He told me, I just woke up and I had 400,000. Only 400. And I went to an architect and they designed a big house. I told him, design a house that can scare me. Don't, don't design a house that... If your vision is too small enough for you to achieve... That is not the vision of God. <laughs> he said, design for me a house that will scare me. The guy saw the house and said, what? It was big. Big. I'm not sure that I want a house that big. It was so big. So this guy shows me. So I asked him, how did you build it? He told me, very simple. I just used to get the script, the, the summons, that used to just get summons, puts on his phone, then he puts them in the ear, then he goes on the site. <laughs> oh my god he gets summons puts them in his ears then he goes 400,000 he starts building in the head mashaka breketele zakatala ye pranda zereba sota katale brosente koya and as he continues to listen to the words as he continues to listen to the word, he starts creating his house. He says, by the time he finished it in the spirit, money started coming. And it's that easy. Even as we just wake up and put chairs. Some of you don't understand what I'm just saying. But pastor, can you Even if they don't come, put chairs again. And then they don't come the next day. And then you add more chairs. <laughs> Am I speaking to somebody? I know your shop is drying. That's okay. Just open it and look at it. I'm a sagaba makaru. Eh? Ngago sigaro gamba. Do kari ju de stoko monji. The stacks of the shop are empty. But you're saying the shop is full. It's called faith. The Bible says the law is not of faith. Some of you, that's why you're struggling. You, you are trying to apply human effort. You're trying to look for explanations of how things are going to come. Some of us stopped explaining ourselves. We even stopped asking how things are going to come. We simply delve into the word of God and choose to believe it for what it is. Faith doesn't ask how. You just close your eyes. And then you start building. 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 And you build and build. Actually now I'm building. You build. 
You build. Until you can even smell the tile. You can touch the walls. <laughs> Tell somebody I'm crazy. Praise the Lord Jesus. God went to Moses and told him, let's add. Let's just add. Let's add. So, the purpose of the law, it was added later on. That's why the man says, for I was alive without the laws. Right? To disclose, listen to what the law does. To disclose and expose to men their guilt. That's what the law does. To disclose and expose to men their guilt because of transgressions and to make men more conscious of sinfulness, not holiness. More conscious of sin. And it was intended to be in effect, are you hearing me? Until the seed, the descendant, the heir should come. Next verse. To and concerning to whom the promise had been made. And it was the law that was arranged. It was ordained by angels. Why? Simply, God needed to show men how sinful they are, how evil they are, how wicked they are. So that when Jesus comes, they just receive him open handed. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus came, the law had finished. Let me show you something that many people are fighting with up to today. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1. Amplified Bible. I'm going to read 10 verses, but I intend to do something important about it. Since the law has merely a rude outline, the foreshadowing of the good things to come instead of fully expressing those things. You hear what the law does? It has an outline of things, but it doesn't express those things. It doesn't manifest them. It can never be by offering the same sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. That means the law can never make you perfect. That's why the Bible says that no flesh shall be justified. Is it Galatians 2? Ten, eh? He says, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Now, I love the way he said it. Not by the faith in Christ. He says, by the faith of Christ. We have believed on Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And as when you receive Jesus, he enters you and then he starts to believe through you. And the Bible says, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There is nothing you can ever do in the works of the law and you're justified. You can never be right by the law. You can never be right by the law. Even if you try, you will never be right by the law. You will never fulfill the ten a hundred percent. Actually, six hundred and something. If we add on the other, the, the ceremonial ones and all. Now back to Hebrews. So the law, the Bible says, can never make perfect those who approach it. I want you to understand the mind of God. To understand Moses. So that when you understand Moses, you'll appreciate grace. That's what I'm trying to do here. Right? The Bible is very clear. That if the first covenant was without fault, there would have not been a need for a second covenant. If the first covenant, the Old Testament covenant was faultless, there would have been no need for a second what? Covenant. How many of you believe it? Now, this is something interesting here. He says, if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been so for the second. Now, I'm going to show you why the first covenant was with fault. Next verse explains it. For finding fault with them. You know why the first covenant had fault? Because it made men faulty. Do you know why the first covenant had fault? Because it made men faulty. For if the first covenant was faultless, there would not have been a necessity for a second covenant. For finding fault with them. He says, Behold the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, if the first covenant had fault because he found fault with men, if he's building a second covenant, he must make a covenant where men are not found with fault. Common sense. Let's go back to Hebrews. I want to finish with that. Now, in Hebrews, next verse, he says, For if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? He says, Since the worshippers 
had once and for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. But why are the sacrifices continuously being offered? Because guilt comes back. Consciousness to sin and guilt. Consciousness to sin and guilt. Those two are brother and sister. They are student and book. They are hand and glove. You, you can use whatever you want to use. You understand? So this is the process. You are made conscious of sin. Then you sin. Then you are held guilty. Then you repent. Then again you are held conscious of sin. Then you become guilt. Then you repent. So you're in that worldwide cycle. That's why sacrifices could not cease during that time. Because there was no sacrifice that could make a man perfect. The law could not perfect a man. There was a necessity that sacrifices were made over and over and over. And the Bible says, next verse, But as it is, these sacrifices annually bring a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take sins away. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering have you not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. And the next verse says, In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not taken no delight. Then I said, Behold, here I am coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of books. When Jesus says that I did not come to remove the law, but to fulfill it, he's fulfilling it through this revelation of the will. And that is because he knows how can he fulfill the law? By satisfying all its requirements. And the one that knew no sin became sin that we being dead unto sins might live unto righteousness. That's the fulfillment of the law. He didn't come to just take it away without its fulfillment. He knew it could only have its ultimate satisfaction by serving it fully. That is why the Bible calls him the propitiation. The word that for propitiation is the perfect sacrifice to fulfill the wrath of God against the sin against you and I. Oh, that's beautiful. Now let's finish this in Hebrews. So he says, I'm coming to do your will to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of book. And when he said just before, you have neither desired nor have you taken delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offering and sin offering, all of which are offered according to the law. The Bible says, he then went on to say, behold, I am coming to do your will. Thus, when he says that, he does away and annuls the first former order as a means of expiating sin so that he might inaugurate and establish the second latter order of expiating sin. And in accordance with the will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated and sanctified through the offering made once and for all of the body of Jesus Christ the Messiah. There is no more offering for your sins. Because there is nothing Jesus didn't die for. He died for your present, past and future sins. Jesus died for your sins. Present, past and future. But some people say, me, I believe past and present. I don't believe in future. That means his blood was not enough. He has to go back to goats and rams. And those are the ones that can only die for past. Even the blood of goats was enough to cover, not to take away. But if you're talking about taking away, when Jesus said once and for all, that means there is no other need for shedding of blood again. Do you know how many people fear to make this statement? Because... This is why they fear. Because when you say Jesus took away your future sins, they think I'm telling people, oh, since he took away, let us do what we want. No, no, no. That is the very reason why we fall in love with him. And when we fall in love with him, you know what love does? It never fails. To change a man. Whoever is forgiven much, they love much. Do you know why I live a righteous life? Because I have received the love of God. I don't hold myself guilty. I love the way we were seated somewhere and some man of God was explaining to us the story of one man of God that we love and I love. And this guy one time was, was on television. He liked interviews and so they start asking, so um, what is this one thing in your life you regret? You know everyone has regrets. And the man of God said, if Jesus forgives my sins and remembers them no more, what business do I have? <laughs> 
remembering my past mistakes. I don't remember. <laughs> I say that's my kind of guy. You're free. You are free. The Bible says once and for all. He has made us holy. Can I see the holy ones? Yes. He says you have put on the new man. Which after him has been renewed in true holiness. And righteousness. I don't hold myself. Listen. I have made mistakes. But I, I don't hold those things on me. I just have this one thing every day. That I'm becoming better and better and better. Why? Because he that began a work in me. Did I begin it? Who will accomplish it? The one who began it. Am I the author? He is the author and the finisher of my faith. When you embrace grace, this is the one miracle that happens. You walk out of things effortlessly. How many of you are witness of that? That the more you started understanding the grace of God, because it is the faith of Jesus working inside you. Do you know what it means to go boldly to the throne of God? Knowing that you receive grace and mercy. To receive grace to help in times of need. He calls us to the throne of grace and love, not the throne of judgment. And there's a reason why. If they understood Moses' part, they would have understood Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So I finish this way. What is the meaning for me knowing that all my sins are gone? Very simple. When I believe that my sins were shed for yesterday, today and forever... I have to accept that now I'm a slave to righteousness. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So, under grace, righteousness is my Lord. Righteousness is my Lord. Righteousness is my purpose. It's my course. Do you know how many men and women of God have fallen off the course and the church cannot embrace them back because they are even worse than the prisons? Because the prison can make you serve your sentence. And after five or six years of that felony or crime, you are a free man to do as you will. But there are people ever since they made a mistake in 1995, they have never been forgiven. They have never been restored. They have never been reinstated in their right positions. Some of you, you're only in good books with people because you've not messed up. Oh no, me, I never went to club. I never did drugs. So I'm not saying that because I have that history. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm speaking for some people who I know very well. They messed up one day. And they've never looked at them the same again. Even when the man of God repents, they made up their minds. They will never put that person on their altar again because they made a mistake in 1995. But the call of God never left that man. The purpose and pattern of God in that man's life is still existent as it was 20 years ago. Because the eyes of righteousness have not been revealed to us, many of us have looked back our Generous, our ministers of the gospel, men who could have come in and been restored and they picked up their pieces. Even the Roman Catholic Church is better than the local of our day. Because we have had cases where guys have sodomized children and done all this nonsense and then they get them in under, they wash them, they cleanse them and reinstate them in their own personal positions. Today when a, a believer or a pastor falls, that is his end. We cannot build another generation. On that kind of principle. We are not providing for men to fall. We are simply saying. That even if you have made the worst mistake in the world. I have good news for you. Jesus paid it. (laughs) 
Jesus paid it all out to him my own. Sin has left a crimson stain. He was it white as snow. Somebody sing and say, Jesus paid it all, all to Him my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was white as snow. That's the good news of the gospel. Listen to me. Your sins, past, present, and future were all paid once and for all. Bask in the love of God. You find that every time you yield to love, you're enslaved to righteousness. Did you hear that? When you yield to the love of God, you're enslaved to righteousness. Do you know the beauty of waking up and you just can't do something because you love God? And more than just that, you've been introduced to a pleasure higher than sin because His love has saturated you. And you're no longer struggling to be right. But His love overflowing you never fails to change you. For He says, for if they be prophecies, they'll fail. For if there will be words of wisdom and knowledge, they'll fail. But love never fails. He that is forgiven much, the Bible says they love much. There is something about embracing the love of God eh, that starts to help you walk out effortlessly. And also to sleep at night to know that even if you have made the worst mistake in the world, there is still grace at Calvary. There is nothing his blood cannot take away. Wow. Just take a minute and thank God for his love. Just thank you for his love for a minute. And to him my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was in what I saw. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Had left a grace. Father, we thank you for your grace. It's because of your grace that some of us have the opportunity to be standing. <laughs> if it was not for your grace, some of us were written off. If it was not for your grace, some of us would not have had a second and third chance and fourth chance. If it was not for your grace, some of us would not have been even accepted to sit amidst the believers. If it was not for your grace, some of us would not have believed to see your goodness in the land of the living. Because there was a time we thought you were too angry with us to ever do anything in us. There was a time we thought that we have messed up so bad that you could never reconsider. But thank you for that blood. Thank you for that blood. Thank you for that blood. Somebody give the Lord a man of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, everything I've shared tonight is for those which have believed. Come and receive the faith of Jesus. That's what grace is. Grace means you don't work on your own works anymore. You allow the faith of God to work through you. Somebody come and receive Jesus. Come and receive Jesus. 
to you I am. Come and receive Jesus. God bless you. Come and receive Jesus. Just as I am without one clean but the thy blood was shed for me and thou be me come to the all of God I come I, I come ask him in the name just come I am unwell, and to read my soul. Oh, what a blow to thee, whose blood can clear. in heaven. <laughs> now, I want you to repeat this other to me. What you guys are going to do is the greatest decision of your life. You're never going to regret it. I'm not promising you. I am telling you. I'm past knowledge. I know. <laughs> past promise. I know. I know. Repeat this other to me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I receive you. I believe that you die and rose again for my sin and for my glorification. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these ones. Anoint them. Strengthen. Deliver. Establish witchcraft is far. I see an anointing coming on some of you already. The power of God Himself sanctifying you. Power of the Holy Ghost. 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 May God use you. May God separate you. May God work through you. May God establish you. May God restore you in Jesus' mighty name. And all saints say, if you're sick, I want you to receive. Don't even put science in it. Just receive your healing simply now. Simply, 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 
Say, I receive my healing. Take it in the name of Jesus. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero. Fenero, make manifest.